Merci. Okay, um, as introduced, I'm Mark Ligo, City Councillor in Oxford and the Oxford Lord Mayor, and it's an absolute honour to be invited over. Okay, so this is the Grenoble Climate Conference, and slide one, pursuing a zero carbon Oxford. Slide two here, as you can see, cities are an essential part of the transition net zero. Cities produce high carbon emissions, but low carbon solutions, such as maps, transit, smart energy grids, are more effectively scalable in dense urban populations. Oxford City Council declared an emerg climate emergency in 2019 and committed to hold a citizens' assembly on climate change. Oxford Citizens' Assembly photos you can see here. Oxford was the first city in the UK to deliver a Citizens' Assembly on the topic of climate change. A Citizens' Assembly is a group of people who are brought together to discuss an issue or issues and reach a conclusion about what they think should happen. The people who take part are chosen so they reflect the wider population in terms of demographics, age, gender, ethnicity, social class, and sometimes relevant attitudes. For example, preferences for small or large estates in and around the city. Citizen assemblies give members of the public the time and opportunity to learn about, discuss a, pot, uh, sorry, a topic before reaching conclusions. Assembly members are asked to make trade-offs and arrive at workable recommendations. The Oxford Citizens Assembly on Climate Change involved a demographically representative sample of 50 residents who learned about climate change and explored different options to cut carbon emissions through a combination of presentations from experts and facilitated workshops. We're extremely fortunate to have an excellent support and advice from experts based within a city like Miles Allen from the UNIPCC, which is United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. What are the key messages from Assembly members? And I think that's the same for everybody. At times you have to be brave, be quick, be ambitious. Include the wider social benefits of action and climate change, example like health, There will be resistance, please don't give up. Take holistic actions. And for me, really importantly, keep involved in a range of diverse voices and don't forget those in poverty. This really is essential if we want to tackle climate change, we really must engage everybody within our own communities. 90% of participants wanted the City Council to go faster than the UK um, government legislation, which is to reach net zero by 2050. Following the Citizens' Assembly, there was a recognised need to step up ambition. As you can see from slide four here, Oxford City Council's estate and operations alone account for 1% of the city's carbon emissions. We are leading the way by committing to reduce these emissions to net zero, hopefully by 2030. It is ambitious, but we've got to set a target. We need a vision. 
We need a strategy. We need to act now. Carbon management plan to improve our energy and efficiency and reduce carbon. £11 million, project, 11 million pound project to install heat pumps at our swimming pools and leisure centres. Electrifying our fleet of vehicles, including our bin and recycling lorries. Scaling up retrofit of social housing. Enabling retrofit of other domestic and commercial properties around the city. And as you can see from the chart up here as well, so you've got 2018 best, uh, baseline emissions and energy consumption in Oxford. So on the left-hand side, you can see, for example, you've got tw uh, transport at 23%, residential buildings, so some of the high ones at 25%. And then the baseline energy consumption by fuel type, which is on the right-hand side over here. And some of the big ones here, the natural gas and electric. Okay, what we've got here is some of the vital partners from Oxford and Oxfordshire. So this is a zero carbon Oxford partnership. Oxford City Council produces 1% of the city emissions, but also plays a key role as a convener of action. We've estimated that we also have the power to influence, and I use that word quite a lot, to influence, to encourage, rather to tell or be told. So the power to influence a further 66% of Oxford's total carbon footprint. Oxford City Council, the Zero Carbon's Oxford Summit in February last year of 21, of the city's most prominent leaders. Both from universities, so the colleges, 39 colleges of Oxford, Oxford Brookshire University, the hospitals, we have three main hospitals and a couple of private hospitals in Oxford. The local authorities, uh, we have two level of local authority, an Oxford City Council and an Oxford County Council are responsible for different um, things. And large businesses, including um, B&W, uh, which plays a vital part to our economy in Oxford as well, and the city's largest shopping centres committed to supporting Oxford's journey to be net zero by 2040. The summit saw the formation of Zero Carbon Oxford Partnership, representing a shift in its approach from focusing just not on organisational emissions to committing a collaborate which allows us to achieve more together than we could individually. And this is something that we've all spoken about the last couple of days. We can't do it on our own. We have to do it in partnership. The more we work together, the louder our voice. The ZCOP Roadmap and Action Plan, published last summer, leverages the power and influence in the city's instructions to make ambitious interventions with both environmental and social benefits. Some of these charities you see on the top right hand corner like Oxlep, which bring lots of businesses together, uh, which is important. And what we have here is some of the well-known charities like Oxfam, and then we've got the um, Oxford Hub, which is a local charity, which look looks at green initiatives as well, so sometimes looking at um, food, for example, food poverty. Okay, so slide seven, the Zero Carbon Oxford Partnership. So I, I spoke to you earlier who they are, and there they are. 
And um, so the ZCOP partners contributed to the development of the roadmap, working with Oxford City Council and the Carbon Trust. The action plan cuts across multiple sectors and focuses on projects that require cooperation and coordination between partners. Unlocking key interventions that would be impossible if working individually. Again, while it's imperative that actually we make sure that partnership working is the most effective way if we want to tackle this. Since the summer, ZCOP has been taking action on several urgent and vital collaborative initiatives that will be the key in keeping the city on path to net zero to the next five or ten years. These actions include a program to scale domestic retrofit across social and private housing, greening last mile delivering by investing in freight consolidation, understanding the future of green skills for Ox's net zero future. Establishing campus-style integrated energy systems. And really important, lobbying the UK government for enhanced funding and ambitious action on climate initiatives. So this photo here was taken face-to-face, -face, one of the first face-to-face -face meetings of the steering group in February 2022 at the mini plant in Oxford. And it's good to see when we talk about inequalities as well and, 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 and gender as well. If you have a look, so the lady here, I'll just come around. For me, it's really passionate to say. So we have Susan Brown, leader of the city council, um, another woman. And we have on this side here, uh, Liz Leftman, who is the leader of the county council, and the deputy leader of the county council is also a lady as well. And at the city council, under Susan's leadership, we make sure when a Labour's policies that actually at least 50% of our cabinet members are female, and we have a, and diverse as well. We are one of the only. Um, very few cities in the city where we look at equalities and make sure we don't say it, we mean it. Okay, slide eight, local energy Oxfordshire. So when I say Leo, that's what I mean, okay? Not the namesake, but the, the acronym local energy Oxfordshire. Local Energy Oxfordshire Project LEO is a partnership between Oxford City and Oxfordshire County Councils, academics from the University of Oxford and Oxford Brookshire University, the Low Carbon Hub and local community groups. Project LEO is one of the most ambitious, wide-ranging, initiative, holistic, smart grid trials ever to be conducted in the UK. Project LEO will accelerate the transition to a smarter, fairer and flexible electricity system. And we also have one of our local councillors, um, Ed Turner, He's also married to um, Oxford's um, MP, Annalise Dodds. And they both live in Rose Hill, which is one of our areas of deprivation. And this is one of our newly built uh, Rose Hill community centres. And it really is um, not just a green community centre, but it's really important that it's the, it's the hub of the city. So your food banks, your libraries, your dance classes, your gyms, and making sure the small gym that we've got up there as well is making sure it's affordable, which is important for local residents. So those who live in with the Rosal area will get a massive reduced um, discount compared to other 
areas in Oxford. Okay, slide nine, Oxford's transport challenges. And we have a few. And I was envious um, when I arrived um, on Sunday and I saw your roads. I thought, wow, what we could do if we had that. Wide roads for pedestrians, cyclists, cars, trams, buses. So, road space in a medieval city is very limited. Like I've said many, many times, that we're restricted what we can do, but this should not stop us. We need to be creative. We need to think outside the box. Traffic levels in the city have built back up towards the pre-pandemic levels and forecast to increase. Bus movement is slowed and there's little space for segregated cycle lanes. Air pollution regularly breaches legal maximum levels in a number of locations around the city centre. Core schemes to address the challenges consulted this year, aiming for approval by Council by 2023. At times, some of the things we're proposing are a little bit contentious, but we've got to do something. And what we need to do is a local authority and as myself and local politicians, when you get it wrong, fail fast and put your hand up and don't be afraid to try new schemes. Okay. As you can see, the blue area here, which is workplace park in Levy, an annual charge paid by employers based on their commuter parking numbers. And what employers can do is pass the charge on to their staff at their discretion. The red dots, traffic filters that only allow certain type of vehicles to pass. And we've got those red dots, dots in there, but we are doing a consultation at the moment, and we must listen as well. And we have to have a look. It's okay having these. These are suggested. I personally don't agree on all of them, but most of them, because we need to look at the evidence as well. What does it mean when you implement some schemes on other areas of Oxford? Because sometimes you might resolve what you res resolve in one area, you could double up in another. The UK's first, UK's first zero emission zone, a zone which drivers must pay a road user charge linked to the vehicle emissions unless exempt. Only 100% zero emission vehicles can be driven in the zone free of charge and which most people in Oxford are happy with that. I think in most uh, city centres, town centres. The red lines, so that's the pilot ZEZ -E -Z in operation for three weeks so far. And the green area is a proposed full ZEZ. -E -Z. So times when I spoke about earlier, to tackle climate change, some things you need to press the accelerate, accelerate button and work faster. Sometimes you need to slow things down, gather the evidence and the research, and make sure if we're going to do it, do it well, and it's got to add value. So, the benefits. Encourage shift from cars to walking, cycling, and public transport. Reduces transport emissions, improving local air quality, and tackling climate change. Reduces traffic noise, generates locally controlled income for local transport policies. Okay. Uh, slide 10. So go ultra low Oxford. So when I say gulo, that's what it means, and I hope you don't confuse you, okay? So this was part funded uh, by Office for Low Emission Vehicles. Supporting Oxford's taxes to go fully electric by 2025. 
which we had lots of consultation with the taxi drivers around this for, for many years. Oxford has many houses with no off-street parking. Gulo is helping to find solutions to help residents transition to electric vehicles. Oxford City Council is also developing an electric vehicle strategy. Okay, as you can see on slide 11, the Energy Superhub Oxford electric vehicle charging. Europe's most powerful EV charging hub is coming to Oxford, being stored at our park and ride. 38 fast and ultra rapid chargers powered by 100% renewable energy. The hub is connected to the national grid and can supply up to 10 megawatts of power and more charges can be added to the future, in the future, sorry. It is being developed by Oxford City Council, Pivot Power and EDF Renewables. This will provide a blueprint for cities around the world. And now onto the battery storage. A 52 megawatt battery connected to the national grid and linked into the electric vehicle charging hub. This very large battery will support more renewables, increase grid resiliency, and create a smarter, more flexible system. Okay, in slide 12 here, what we've got is the Energy Super Hub Oxford photo, what we envisage it will be. This is an artist's impression of what it will look like. So other work, Oxford City Council is also working hard to protect our environment and adapt to climate change. We are protecting our green space and working to achieve biodiversity net gain. Improving tree cover through our urban forest strategy and planting trees as the Queen's Green Canopy, celebrating the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. 70 years on the throne. She's not doing too bad. Developing our resi resilience to flooding and migrating flood risk. Reducing waste. Oxford has one of the highest recycling rates in any city of the UK. So what we do that as well, we've got over 30,000 students. So what we do when we have our, um, when the universities have freshers fair, so in the first week, first two weeks, we engage with many students as possible. So we'll have students who are staying in student accommodation blocks, but we also have a lot more students living in what we call HMOs which is houses with multiple occupancies, so more than between three and six students in one house. And we encourage each household to have a recycling champion, so making sure that, that they recycle well, so their food waste, the, 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 the rubbish, what goes to landfill. And during Freshers' Week, we get as many students as possible to sign up to Oxford Recycling. Then they will receive a text message the day before, sorry, the, on, on the day, telling them what bin to put out. For example, a blue bin, which is your recycling, and your green food caddy. So they get a reminder, uh, everybody who signs up to the programme as well. We've also got lots of volunteer groups, which um, a few of them started during the pandemic as well. One thing... Uh, the sad news that the pandemic has taught us actually, we got to know our neighbour. We got to know who was living opposite us. We got to know that were nature reserves, you, you know, close to us, countryside sites, you know, realised that actually there were people around us who were vulnerable. 
that needed our help. There were lots of charities, organisations. There was good work going on. And then from that, we formed more relationships. We volunteered. We did the prescription drop-offs. We did the food parcels. We did the tree planting. We started planting bulbs. We come up with new creative ideas. We're giving it, okay, we're getting lots of complaints of cars parking on grass verges in Oxford. Okay, it doesn't work by shouting at the driver. So we'll do it a different way. We'll use reverse psychology. What we'll do, we'll plant bulbs. Then they'll feel guilty. <laughs> and there are many schemes that we've done as well to help with biodiversity and you know, working with schools, universities, and working really closely with um, businesses as well. It's really important. If there's business within your neighborhood, what can they do to partner up? It's really, really important as well. And we've gone strength to strength. And it goes to show when early spring comes, you know, in my city of Oxford, you know, it puts a smile on my face when I start seeing those flowers coming through. And things like bulb planting, which it, there's no, hardly any cost at all. Nature looks after itself. And then what it does, it encourages other people to do more and be more creative as well. Um, oh, yes, also improving water quality. So there's a big, big campaign, not just in Oxford, Oxfordshire, but in, but in England as well, working together to stretch the River Thames, designated for bathing water status. The problem is at the moment, Thames Water is private, like a lot of our utility companies, like a lot of our transport companies, and we are limited. So what, again, what we have to do is work in partnership. We encourage, we influence. That's what we have to keep doing as well. A perfect model would be a 50-50, because you need each other. You need the private sector, you, you need the public sector. Um, but again, but the important thing is, what I want to say as well, like I alluded to earlier, is just making sure that um, we help and support each other as well, is making sure that actually those whose voices wouldn't be heard you go find them, okay? Those who generally come to you will get involved in most consultations, uh, but we need to make sure that the normal person, the real person, those who it affects, that we'll have to go out and do that reach. So it's really important to go out and do that roadshow, speak to people, otherwise you don't get a true picture of whatever the issues are, so. Right, I'm just gonna show you um, a, a couple of videos. One. Uh, <laughs> that's another story we can discuss later on. But, um, so, for example, I did fly here. I'm very well known in Oxford with Move with Mayor Mark. I cycle every day. I walk every day. I run. I go to the gym. I go swimming. I volunteer. And I've done this for over 20 years, even before I was a politician. I will get back to your question, but, but briefly, I, um, I had to make a decision if I wanted to be here, and that decision was to fly. When I tweeted a photo, I did that deliberately. I wanted to be here, but I also wanted to debate. And interesting, at the thousand replies on Twitter, 90% um, didn't answer the question thought, that I thought they might do, actually. How do we make sure that actually the transport's affordable? How do we make sure that we really tackle climate change rather than actually, I'm going to climate change conference by plane? But also, going back to your question, so there's a lot of things that we have to do, and I think what we have to do is grassroots level, okay, the lived experience. If we want to make real changes, we need to get into our communities, we need to understand people's habits, like you said, okay, how they shop, why they shop. Okay, we know that some of our poorer areas in Oxford, and yes, we have four estates, poorer areas in Oxford, that are worst performing in the UK. Oxford is just not about the colleges and independent schools. Okay, so we have to look at things locally. So we have to make sure to normalise things, making sure that our shops, local shops in our estates, that they have healthy food. We know some of them 
are overpriced and not healthy. We've got to make sure that we value, which we have done very well with the City Council, value our green spaces. We've also set up locality groups with the City Council in our deprived areas, making sure that they have access to all that they need with the uh, City Council, to making sure that, that any help, if any businesses need help, also advising them about various, so again, we work with schools with initiatives, so not telling people what to do, but encouraging people to eat healthy all the time, where you're purchasing your food, looking at markets, how far you're traveling. But if we're gonna make a change, going back to your question, we've, all, we've got to do it at a local level. We need to be realistic what we can do now because what works for you won't work for you, won't work for you. And this is why when we try to tackle inequalities, we've got it the wrong way around. We've got 80% of it right the last 20, 30 years. Sorry, 80% of what we've tried is benefited middle class or up. It has not benefited our deprived areas at all because we just put a template in thought what works in this area will work for that area. What works for that person will work for that person. We didn't go into our communities. We didn't get the true lived experience. We didn't do it at a grassroots level. We just presumed we knew our communities. And that's one thing the pandemic taught us as a city council. We didn't know our communities. We didn't realize how many people were going through the poverty trap. We've got, we've got a big cohort of people in Oxford, working families that are relying on food parcels. You can't presume just people work, they're not in poverty. So again, it's doing it at a local level, you do it at the grassroots level, and then you build up. The last 34 years we've done it up here, worked down and presumed we knew the best. So what we all have to do, to, we have a saying is, fail fast, don't be afraid to try something. If it doesn't work, try something else. Be honest, be brave, be bold. But we have to be caring and we have to listen. Thank you.